You may be seated. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from Psalm 78, 1 through 20. Reading a few extra verses than, than we normally read, but, but it's because the psalmist is calling us to remember. To remember who we are as the people of God. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which He commanded our ancestors to teach His children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget His deeds, but would keep His commandments. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts are not loyal to God, whose spirits are not faithful to Him. The men of Ephraim though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by His laws. They forgot what He had done, the wonders He had shown them. He did miracles in sight of their ancestors in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by, night, by day and with the light from the fire by night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made the waters flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? True, he struck a rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? Can he supply meat for his people? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, our memories are, are so important, aren't they? I, I love the privilege of of reliving many of life's most important moments. I love to relive them through my mind's eye. And, and I love to recall all of the graduations of my family that, that we've enjoyed over the years. I, I especially love remembering my, my wedding day and the weddings and anniversaries of family and friends and, and the birth of our children and grandchildren. I love to remember the vacations that we've taken as a family and, and those that we've taken with friends. I love remembering the places that I've been and, and the people that I've met and, and the churches that I've served. I love to remember the joy within my family growing up and the joy that we share in our family today. I love the fact that, that I am blessed to remember so much that I can speak and read and listen and learn. And it's all because God has given me the gift of recall. See, without memory, education would be useless. Without memory, we would be doomed to repeat our, our past mistakes over and over again. Without memory, we, we couldn't recall our loved ones from one moment to the next. Recollection is a gift of grace. Christ's sacrifice would be in vain but for the gift of remembrance. One of the best blessings that we have is our ability to recall the past. As I mentioned in, in the children's sermon, Jesus knew just how important the gift of memory actually was. Jesus knew that it's the key to becoming who God wants us to be. Jesus understood that, that if his disciples didn't remember who he was and whose he was, they never would have had the chance to join him in living out the will of God 
for the people of the world. And so Jesus invited them to actively remember where he as Lord and Savior would fit into their lives. It, it wasn't an invitation to thrive on an independence that was bought and paid for by the sons and daughters of the United States of America. Theirs, theirs was sacrificial. It was an invitation to remember the freedoms within our nation and, and how we've obtained those freedoms. And then those who, who died in service to our nation... Well, they invite us to use those freedoms to honor others. But Jesus was an invitation to be free from sin. Free to live a life that honors God as well as others. The gift that memory provides is that the invitation of Christ, though made long in the past, is very much present today. It's an invitation that reminds us that we are a covenant people. We are people of the promise, the divine promise of God. That which was has shaped that which is. And all that is will influence that which will be. Matt Woodley preached, he said, he said you might think the covenant love promised through David and, and the assurance of forgiveness promised through the Levites must have been good news for the demoralized Jewish exiles who lived 2,400 years ago. But what's that got to do with my life? What's that got to do with us here in 2021? Well, the exciting news, he says, is, is that the promise of David's covenant always pointed beyond itself to a greater covenant with a greater king who was still in the line of David. And, and likewise, the promise, uh, the promise of Levi's tribe pointed beyond itself to a better way to deal with sin. The blood of the bulls and the lambs was never meant to be the final answer to the forgiveness of sin. And, and finally, Woodley, Woodley points out that, that, that if you go into Matthew and you notice those first few verses of Matthew, it's, it's a genealogy. It's the lineage of David. And... and and the, within that lineage, we, we see where Christ fits. And, and a few verses after, that's all over. Jesus is, is named Emmanuel, for he will save his people from their sin. And Jesus ends up being the fulfillment of, of two lines, the line of David and the line of, of, of Levi. And, and you've got both of them that give us the covenant love and the assurance of forgiveness. This genealogy helps us to find our new identity as children of God. And when Christ died on the cross for our sin, on our behalf, in our place, it says we matter to God. God wants us in, in his, his family picture album. And you know, it's so easy for us to think of ourselves as insignificant. But the gospel gives us significance in Christ. In Christ, we've been chosen, we've been adopted, we've been empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Christ, we belong, and, and in Christ, our past is forgiven. Now, I realize that for some people, recalling the past isn't, isn't a good thing always. The pain of loss and the heartache of hurt isn't necessarily something that, that anyone wants to, to relive, let alone repeat. But the truth is that that all of it defines who we are. And were it not for our past, the good and the bad, we wouldn't be who we are today. And knowing that and understanding that's critical. If you ever seen the, the Disney movie Lion King, do we have any, any of those folks out here? Okay, okay. Well, in The Lion King, Simba has forgotten who he is. And, and because of the loss of his father, he begins to life simply for himself until is called into account. And, and I want you to watch this, this clip here. Shh. Look down there.
That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. Simba, you are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. No, please, don't leave me. Father! Don't leave me. Remember who you are. Folks, this weekend is by taking a good, hard look at ourselves. Not just as individuals. It's by taking a good, hard look at who we are as a nation. These words might be familiar to you. I hope they are. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Remembering is rarely valued because it requires us to face our failures. It requires us to remember our roots. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as seem to them most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And so from April 12, 1861 to May 9, 1865, we destroyed life, limb, and liberty to preserve a more perfect union. Memorial Day remembers the speech of, of President Lincoln at Gettysburg, dedicating that plot of ground on one of the bloodiest sites of the war. Remember these words? Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those here who gave their lives that the nation might live. It's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dictate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. 
it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have fought here and have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion the cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Lincoln's war continues to be fought. It's being fought in our workplaces, in our schools, in the streets of our cities, and sadly, even in our churches. As usual, we say the words without living them. Lincoln's assassination was only the first shot in the continuing war for us to be one nation under God, living the truth that all God's children are created equal and worthy of full participation in this land of ours. The shootings that have rampaged our nation just in the past month remind us that we have failed to honor any such understanding of equality. We have dis dismissed the vision of our forefathers. Now is the time, as Martin Luther King Jr. stated, that we must judge a man by the character of his life rather than the color of his skin. Until we do, we are doomed to the cycle of death that has grasped the great nations that have gone before us. And as the prophet Amos once said, let justice roll like a river and the righteous like a never-failing stream. Let us remember that God and God's mighty acts of salvation are not something we can just do. It takes more than the nod of a head. It takes more than the agreement of the heart. It takes more even than the stroke of a pen. There is more to remembering than turning our minds in the right direction. Remember who you are and teach your children so that the next generation will know God. So the next generation will know God's people. Put your trust in God and don't forget His deeds. Keep His commands. Write them on your heart Recite them with your lips. Live them with your lives. And remember that there is a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There is a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Remember that, that at the cross we surrender our life. Because at the cross Christ's love ran red. And our sins washed white. Remember that we owe it all to Jesus. Remember that because Jesus is who he is, there is a place where sin and shame are powerless, where, where our hearts can be filled with peace, the peace of God and forgiveness. Here we bow down. Here on holy ground, hope is found. Now is the time for us to really comprehend that ancient Greek saying, know thyself. I'm sure you, that I've, I've told you before, but, but almost every time I left the house as a kid, my dad would say, remember who you are and whose you are. And, and I think my dad wanted me to look inside myself and, and see my history, the, the legacy of my ancestral family to that part of him and my mom that that centered me and, and shaped me and set my life on a trajectory that helped to make me who I am today. Whenever I was out there on my own, he wanted me to remember the presence of God. The presence of God was with me and within me. He wanted me to remember that, that I was and always would be more than I imagined myself to be. 
more than what I had become in that, in that moment. My parents have always wanted me to see myself with different eyes. And that requires a hard look for sure. It's usually painful, it's, it's frequently disturbing, and it's often dangerous. Why? Because it means that, that we expose ourselves to judgment. People will be able to offer an opinion on our lives, and, and that opinion won't always be favorable. And that's scary. And so remember what the Apostle Paul writes in his first letter. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. See, once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Our, our psalmist this morning wants us to remember that we are the people of God. We are the people of purpose. We are the people to make known the sacrifice of our Savior to set us free from sin. My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things of old, things that we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders that He has done. Remember, remember that there's got to be more than going back and forth, more than doing right and wrong. We got to quit thinking that, that there's worth in what we do and remember God's amazing grace. Because when we do, it doesn't matter the bumps, it doesn't matter the bruises, it doesn't matter the scars. We know the truth. And the truth is that the cross has made us flawless. When we realize that, the hurt, the wounding, the pain, the truth is that doesn't matter because the cross has made us flawless. So take a breath, smile, say, it's all right, it's okay. The cross was enough. The cross has made you flawless. And so in the midst of the picnics and the parties and the parades and, and the people that you care deeply about this weekend, remember the sacrifice. The sacrifice of the men and women who died to give us the privilege of this day. But even more so, remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who lived died, rose again, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Remember, because in remembering, we have hope for a better tomorrow. Amen?